Greetings and welcome <clears throat> to the South African Holocaust and Genocide Foundation's second session of our six-part series, Women's Agency During Nazism, which has been most generously sponsored by the Austrian Embassy of Pretoria. Our opening event last week was titled Rethinking Women's Narratives and provided an academic introduction to the topic of women's roles their memories in our societies and how they were remembered. For those of you who may have missed it, you can find it on YouTube by following the link provided in the chat. Today's session is titled Women in Resistance, Reflections on Nazi Europe and Apartheid South Africa. And we'll take on a different approach and investigative specific and investigate specific biographies. Tonight, we are looking into the memory and stories of individual women who resisted during the 1930s and 40s in Europe and during apartheid in South Africa. The first part of our webinar will be a 20 minute pre recorded tour of the current special exhibition at the Document Documentation Archive of Austrian Resistance in Vienna. It is about three Viennese sisters who left fascist Austria in the 1930s to go and fight in the Spanish Civil War against Franco, and later as part of the resistance in France and Belgium against the Nazis. Sonia Frank, curator of the exhibition, and Uli Makomaski will introduce us to the Three Sisters story and a part of Sonia's own family history. Sonia Frank is a writer, artist, activist and promoter of arts and culture, and works especially on memorial projects. She is the author of Young Austria, Austrians in British Exile, 1938 to 1947, for Free and Democratic Austria, which also initiated the broader memorialization and a memorial in London for the Young Austrian Organization, which by the way, Sigmund Freud was the president. Her latest book featuring the three sisters, Selma, Berta, and Gwendolyn Steinmetz, was published earlier this year in German with English descriptions. Sonia started her research into the three sisters and their cousin Fanny, Sonia's grandmother, after discovering a suitcase with their documents and ended up writing a 300-page book featuring over 100 women in resistance connected to the three sisters. But before we start the film, a few housekeeping rules. For the duration of the film and lecture, all cameras and audio will be switched off. Should you wish to ask a question, please make use of the Q&A section or chat at the bottom of your screen. And Ari, I hand over to you. The three sisters and Sonia's grandmother engaged in the battle for restoring a democratic Austria from 1933 onward. Together with their friends and comrades in Spain, France and Belgium, they fought in the anti-fascist resistance. Many Austrian women were either communists, sympathizers or socialists and joined the resistance in order to take part in the battle against fascism. They fought for the liberation of their homeland and contributed to the liberation of countries occupied by Hitler. Fanny Landesmann, later Grossmann, grandmother of Sonja, worked in the Austrian Center in London and helped there as Young Austrian official. Young Austria was one of the most important anti-fascist organizations of Austrian refugees in Great Britain. Her husband, Ludwig Grossmann, was lucky to be able to emigrate to Great Britain after having been imprisoned in the Buchenwald concentration camp, together with the famous Austrian writer Jura Seufer. 
you're a sulfur did not share Grossman's luck. He died of typhoid, which he caught when transporting the dead bodies of prisoners. Now to the exhibition boards of Selma Steinmetz and her sisters. They were born in the Austrian-Hungary monarchy. Selma was born in 1907 in Vienna. She studied German language and history. She was involved as a student in anti-fascist resistance in Austria. As a Jewish and leftist teacher, she could not get a job at the public school in the Austro-Fascist state. Therefore, she had to leave Vienna because of anti-Semitism in 1937. This is the family picture. It was taken in Vienna in the late 1920s. Selma is the eldest daughter of Helene and Heinrich Steinmetz. Berthe is behind her mother Helene. The youngest sister, Gundel, uh, she sits in front of her mother Helene. Here is their cousin Fanny today, who was later also part of the resistance in Paris, as well as Berthe and Selma. The next poster shows Selma in the resistance. Selma worked near Paris with refugee children. After the attack by the German Wehrmacht, she escaped to the south of France in June 1940. Later, she was a member of the Travail Anti-Allemand, short TA, that means anti-German work. The TA was the German-speaking section of the FTPF, Franc Tireur et Partisan Français, who fought against fascists. It was founded as a section of the French resistance in autumn 1941. Selma Steinmetz fought in the resistance in France as well as her partner Oskar Grossmann, her younger sister Berthe Tados, her brother-in-law Tibor Tados and her cousin Fanny Tutti. Well, here is Selma with her niece Anne after the liberation of France. Anne, the daughter of Berthe and Tibor Tados, was born in Cannes in 1943. Selma was arrested in summer 1944 and survived severe torture by Gestapo. She did not reveal any names during her torture and therefore she saved the lives of her sister Berthe and her niece and many comrades. CADI, this document of the Centre d'Action et de Défense des Amigrés confirmed Selma's membership in the Austrian Liberation Front. And here, the confirmation of the Association des Internés et des Partis Politiciens granted Selma subsidy aid. And here, the French Communist Party conf Party's confirmation shows that Selma was imprisoned in Montluc Fresen and Trancy. Selma's partner Oskar Grossmann here was a communist editor. He fled to Vi from Vienna to Prague in order to avoid arrest. In 1939 he left for Paris. From 1942 he was an official of the Travail anti allemand in Lyon. Selma supported the production of Oscar's newspaper Soldat am Mittelmeer, which was smuggled into the barracks of the Wehrmacht Sol soldiers in order to win them over for the resistance. Oscar fell into the hands of Gestapo decoy, was pos possibly tortured and murdered in Lyon in summer 1944. Selma Steinmetz here after the war, here in the middle. She worked in a public library. Here she is with her colleagues in 1948. 
1949, she wrote an article about the Women's Day in a journal. This is her article. Uh, her publication, The Freiheitskampf, of the Documentation Center of the Austrian Resistance, is listing its archive collection in 1973. As a librarian, Selma and her colleagues removed fascist literature in Austrian libraries. In the 1950s, she worked for the Austrian radio program Russische Stunde, Russian Hours, later as journalist for the communist women's magazine Stimme der Frau, Women's Voice. From 1963 on, she built up the, and managed the library of the Documentation Center of the Austrian Resistance. She was involved in humanitarian projects and stood up for including Roma and Sinti in the community for concentration camp survivors. Selma was the first, very first woman and scientist to publish in 1966 on the persecution of Roma and Sinti under National Socialism. Her scientific work was often quoted. She saved the remembrance of persecuted and murdered Austrian authors in World War II. This poster shows Selma Steinmetz in the 1960s and the 1970s. Selma was honored for her fight for freedom with the Declaration of Honor for Services to the Liberation of Austria, and later with the Silver Medal for Services to the Republic of Austria. She died in June 1979, aged 72, and was buried in her mother's grave at the Jewish part of the Central Cemetery in Vienna, where an inscription also reminds of her father, Heinrich Steinmetz, who was murdered in Lodz. Selma's words, Wissen is Macht, Knowledge is Power, were meant as a mandate. Selma's nephew, Georg Hernstedt, gave me her old suitcase for this documentary. In this suitcase was her estate as well as some original documents and objects belonging to the three sisters. Now we come to Berthe Tados. Berthe Tados was born in 1909. She was first married to Otto Natzler, later to Tibor Tados, a Hungarian author and resistance fighter in France. Berthe Tados worked as milliner in Vienna, and here is a picture of the shop she had worked in at Maria Hilferstraße, which later on it was confiscated by the Nazis. As an early communist during Austrofascism, she had also worked for the Red Aid. This organization mainly helped the families of imprisoned comrades. Berthe helped as a courier for the Communist Party together with her sister Selma. They transferred illegal papers from Vienna to Prague and back again. In summer of 1937, Berthe and Selma moved to Paris via Switzerland. Berthe supported the transport organization for interbrigadists who passed through Paris on their way to Spain to fight against Franco. And this picture shows, shows Berthe with her husband, uh, Tiber Dardes, and her daughter, Anne. Berthe fought in the resistance in France with her cousin, Fanny Toutet, in the Paris area, as well as, her, as Berthe's later husband, Tiber Dardes, Edmond de Neuve was honored by Yad Vashem. He confirmed in the 1960s that Berti was forced to live in under inhuman conditions in the south of France from August 1942 to September 44. After the war, she worked in the transport organization in Paris again. 
She assisted young Austrians from London on their return to Austria. After World War II, she lived with her family in Budapest for 10 years, where she worked as a producer of German language radio programs broadcasted weekly to the neighboring Austria. Pertes hope for a democratic, independent Hungary, Hungarian state was destroyed with the invasion of the Warsaw Pact troops in 1956. Tibor Tardos was imprisoned as a system critical author. With Bertha's initiative and the help from Simone Signore, she's here, and Louis Aragon, Tibor was released from prison. Later, Berthe lived with her daughter in Austria, working for Lobakimi. Berthe's daughter, Anne Tardus, is sitting here, wrote about her brother, who died in 1941 in France. Berthe had a previous husband, and they had a son named Jill. He died at age one of hemophilia. Berthe passed away in 1997 in Vienna and bequeathed her body to the anatomy department. Her, sisters, her sister Gundel did as well one year later. Gundel Steinmetz was born in 1916 and became a seamstress in Vienna. She left for Paris in 1935 and later worked as nurse in the Spanish Civil War. These pictures show Gundel with her colleagues in the Civil War. After the victory of Franco, Gundel was briefly interned in France. Later, she joined the Austrian resistance group Österreichische Freiheitsfront in Belgium. This is Gundel's membership card. Gundel Steinmetz and her later husband, Paul Hernstadt, were both active members of the Austrian Freedom Front, Front National Autrichien in Brussels. The Austrian resistance fighters in Belgium cooperated with the Belgian resistance and were connected to Travail anti allemand shortly TA, in Paris. Gundel was head of Mädelarbeit, girls' work. Mädel is a Viennese expression for girls. It was extremely dangerous work. They tried to convince Wehrmacht soldiers in Belgium to stand up against Hitler. In 1943, some friends of Gundel even returned from France to Austria with fake documents as foreign workers to continue their fight there. Many of Gundel's friends and friends of her sisters were imprisoned, tortured or murdered by the Nazi in the occupied countries. In July 1944, Gundel was arrested and tortured in Brussels. Afterwards, she was kidnapped by a Wehrmacht officer and brought to Germany as a hostage. She escaped thanks to a hospital doctor in Bonn and returned via Brussels to Vienna in July 1945. After her return, she worked as an office manager, later as a literary translator in Vienna. Gundel left the Communist Party in 1969. In the 1970s, she received a Youth Literature Prize. Later, she worked on a documentary about Austrians in Belgian exile. Sonja reads Gundel's first letter from Vienna to her cousin Fanny Grossmann in London. It was written on the 12th of July, 1945. Dear Fanny, I still see you in my mind's eye as a lean child's head. Only the expression of your eyes was too old. And now 
this child's head is said to have turned into a woman's head. And as I've heard, you even have become a mother. Do you remember Lotte Sonntag? She came from Germany a few weeks ago, where she was in a concentration camp for two years and suffered accordingly. Do you know whom she met there? Funny today. She is said to have splendidly held up in the camp. Everyone thinks highly of her. I'm not surprised. She is one of the best in the family. My sisters also suffered a great deal. Selma's husband was in a terrible condition at the Gestapo, blind and seriously injured. She still has no news from him. We have to fear the worst. By the way, he was a Grossman too, Oskar Grossman. You have probably heard of him. She herself was terribly tortured. But luckily, she escaped during the liberation. She has aged a lot, but has developed very well and is now with us and very active. Berthe has lost a child and probably also her husband. He has been deported since 1942. She now has a child, an Antardas, especially adorable. She herself has become terribly thin and nervous. And the third of the Steinmetz, I, came from Germany two months ago. I was enormously lucky. I ran away when I was arrested and was shot then. As a result, I very badly broke my leg. Therefore, I fortunately spent seven months in the hospital. So I spared myself the concentration camp. Despite all of this, our nerves suffered a lot in Germany. I was in the Rhineland and went through almost uninterrupted bombardments. Moreover, I was immobile due to my leg. Let's forget it. Hopefully, bigger worries will make us forget the old ones. So, Fanel, now I have given you a family chronicle and I hope to get one from you soon. Little big funnel, feel yourself tightly hugged by your old cousin Gundel Steinmetz. The Austrian resistance fighter Jakob Popzanger stated in 1995, without any doubt, female comrades had the most dangerous work in our group. They could have been imprisoned by the Gestapo every day. Bob Zanger's wife, Erna, and Zilli Spitz here, they were survivors of the male Arbeit. They were good friends of Gundel Herrnstadt Steinmetz. Thank you for watching our exhibition. The three sisters, Selma, Bertha and Gundel, born Steinmetz, women in the resistance 1933 until 1945 and we hope you found it interesting. Thank you so much for taking the time, Sonia and Uli, for recording the special exhibition, especially for tonight. Really has been very interesting, and I'm sure there's going to be lots of questions coming in the chat for you later on this evening. In the second, um, in this the second half of tonight's webinar, we will travel in time and space and investigate the the memory of women's resistance during apartheid. 
LB Sachs will introduce us to Pilan Ndwandwe through Judith Mason's art installation housed at the Constitutional Court, The Man Who Sang and The Woman Who Kept Silent. Through this installation, we will get to know the roles and narratives of women during apartheid. Just as LB Sachs was appointed to the Constitutional Court of South Africa by Nelson Mandela in 1994, as a Constitutional Court judge, Justice Sachs was the chief architect of the post-apartheid constitution. As one of the 11 Green Robe judges, he participated in landmark rulings many of which were ju judgments on discrimination law and established rights to equality and dignity. Through his time as a justice, he earned the reputation as the conscience of the court. He has 14 honorary degrees across four continents and received the Reconciliation Award in 2009. Justice L.B. Sachs was also involved with the development of the Constitutional Court building and its art collection. The aforementioned art installation, The Man Who Sang and The Woman Who Kept Silent, being one of them. He has authored several books, including The Free Diary of L.B. Sachs and The Strange Alchemy of Life and Law, which was his second book to win the coveted Alan Payton Award. It now gives me great pleasure to hand over to you, L.B. Thank you, Heather, and thank you, the very, very lovely people from Austria. Uh, I feel so deeply moved by the story of the three sisters. Uh, for them and for what they did, uh, and it's bringing back memories of, of women in our struggle who also were in the resistance, uh, many in the Communist Party, not all of them, uh, not all of whom survived, and I'm going to pick up a little bit from your story in the middle of Europe uh, to our story here in Southern Africa. And I'm going to begin what seems to be at a place far, far, far away uh, in the Constitutional Court, going about our business, uh, defending fundamental rights of South Africans. And I meet the uh, wife of the Chief Justice of our court, Arthur Chaskerson, uh, and, and, and she says, Albe, there's an exhibition. You absolutely have to go and see. This is in Cape Town. And, and uh, the exhibition was done by an artist. Uh, her name, uh, the, the artist, uh, had been a teacher of, of, of uh, Mrs. Chaskerson. And, and I went to the exhibition. I looked around. And the first thing I saw was a blue dress hanging. And then I saw a picture of a kind of a fence and a snarling dog and the dress hanging in that picture. And Judith Mason was the artist and she was there. And I spoke to her and I said, well, what's the story behind it? And then she told me that she'd been listening to the stories of the Truth Commission in South Africa, of people who'd been involved in terrible deeds, but coming forward to tell the truth, to own up to what they had done. And one of them was a sniggering a security agent of the South African security, the army forces. And he told the story of a woman, Pilan Dwandwe. He said, we'd captured her and we were going to execute her. Gosh, she said she was so brave. And she said, can I sing the national anthem? Kozi Sikaleli Africa and Kozi Sikaleli. And then we shot her and we buried her. And the man took her to the grave, not took her, took the authorities after to the grave so that her bones were recovered. And it was noticed that her private parts were covered by a small piece of blue plastic. And Judith was so moved by the story that she created a dress for my sister who'd been killed. And she wrote beautiful words on it. Sister, this may not be the whole armor of God, but you are fighting darkness and wickedness in sordid places. 
and putting that blue plastic over you was such a simple, commonsensical, housewifely thing to do. And they didn't compound their treatment of you by stripping you a second time. Humbagashli, I'm going to where seas were. Go bravely, I'm going to where seas were, the arm ring of the ANC. And I looked at the dress, I heard the story, and I said, but Judith, this picture is so harsh. Uh, can we get it for the court, but can you do another picture showing that we did survive, we did get through? And he did another picture that showed three big burning, you can see them there, uh, braziers of the man who sang, the woman who kept silent. And I said that that picture is too soft. Can't you combine the two? And the two are combined into one picture. So that we got all three as a triptych in the Constitutional Court. And having this triptych in our court, in a way, was to honor all the women who had struggled for freedom in South Africa through Bill and Wandwe, through the artist Judith Mason, through the beautiful words written there. It, it somehow, for me, as one of the judges on the court, symbolized why we had a constitution, why we had a constitutional court, the importance of humanity and everything that we were doing, and honoring those who struggled and, and died for our freedom. I'm going to say a few words about other women who died for our freedom. Victoria Kange, whose husband, Griffiths and Kange, had been assassinated, both lawyers defending people in court, and he'd been assassinated. And some years later, she was assassinated with knives, bloody, terrible hit squad in South Africa. Some years later, Ruth First, brilliant writer, speaker, activist at the University of Waterman Line in Mozambique received a letter bomb from the head squads. Her face was blown off. Jeanette Schoon and her daughter Katrina in Angola, also part of the resistance, killed by a letter bomb. Dorothy September assassinated in Paris, the ANC representative in Paris assassinated. Four women who died for our freedom. Women in struggle in the resistance in the underground. Black women, many, 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 many prominent amongst them, Dorothy Niambi in Pozulu Natal, three years in jail, banning order comes out, another 10 years in jail. Tandi Modise, well known to South Africans today, spent many years in jail. We campaigned for their release internationally. And Tandi today is the speaker of the National Assembly, a wonderful person with a great spirit, and she lived on to be part of the new democratic South Africa. Let me end by returning to the Constitutional Court. We decided to build our new court building on the site of the old Fort Prison in Johannesburg, where so many had been in jail, so many had suffered, for our freedom. And we had an international competition. And at one stage, we noticed that there were only men on the board of the jury. So we decided to ask Tenjim Tenso, who was the director of the Gender Commission, the South African Gender Commission created by our constitution to advance the rights of women under our constitution. And then he said, why did you put me on? You saw there were only men. And we said, yes, that's true. But she turned out to be the most effective member of, 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 of the Gender Commission. Wanting, she said, I want a building that will be for my mother. My mother, her mother had been a working class woman who took in laundry from white people to be able to send her son to university and then afterwards her daughter to university. And Tenji had said, my mother is frightened of big buildings. 
I want a building that is smiling, that is not frowning. And she was the one who first chose the building that's now our famous constitutional court, that's open and friendly. And I'll end with a story that Tenji told me during the exile days, when I had was exiled in Mozambique in Maputo, and, and she spent uh, some time uh, moving from one posting to another. She had been the head of Mkonto Wesiswe, the armed units of the ANC in Uganda, a woman in command of men, not all of them were happy with that. And I'm expecting to see a rather uh, powerful, strong woman come in and the smiling, friendly person comes and she tells me the story about her mother. And she said, you know, I'll be, my mom took in washing so that my brother and I could go to school and university. And my brother is a very lovely person, but he, he enjoyed parties too much. And he went to university and he failed the first year, he failed the second year and he dropped out. And now I go to university and I join the underground, I join the resistance and I can't tell my mother that I'm leaving university to join the resistance. And I know it's breaking her heart that a second child is also dropping out of university. And she said only after she'd been in the underground, after she'd been in prison, in the very prison where we're building our court today, where we, our court stands today, she went to Lesotho and then she could invite her mother to come and see her. And she said, she told me, she told me, Mama, I couldn't tell you why I dropped out of university. I knew how sad you were, but I joined to join the resistance. And her mother said, Tenji, my daughter, you did it for the nation. I'm so proud of you. And I'm so proud of Tenji, and I'm so proud of Tenji's mother, and I'm so proud of all the women who fought so hard for our freedom in South Africa, who contributed so much, and many who are still fighting for the more expanded freedom and the full rights for everybody and against gender-based violence uh, for, every, uh, for freedom in, in South Africa today. Thank you. Wow, uh, LB, um, it makes me quite teary to listen to these remarkable women, both the women that you mentioned during your talk, and also to Sonia and uh, Uli talking about the three women who were resistant fighters um, in a time which, whether you were in Europe or whether you were in South Africa, was very difficult to oppose um, the regime at the time um, and to do something constructive. Um, Sonia, maybe if I come to you first, um, there is a, a very nice comment that I would like to share with you. Um, it says, very powerful story on the three sisters on women's agency in the face of wickedness, sad and heartbreaking reality but extremely inspiring boldness. Sonia, you, you know, you talk about the story and now in, in 2021, you have an exhibition. Is this the first time that these three women um, are being celebrated for their contribution yeah. during this period of time? Yes, indeed, yes. Uh, the, the three sisters, um, Selma Perte and Gundel Steinitz uh, were cousins of my grandmother. And my grandmother, Fanny Grossman, passed away in 2009. Then I started to document their stories and I made the book Young Austria. This was an activist organization in Great Britain. Uh, where Fanny Grossman was uh, an official, an official. And uh, when I finished this project, this memorial project, I thought I should write also a book about their cousins who was brave women in the resistance in France and in Be Belgium. And a good friend of my parents, uh, Shani Margulis, asked me 
to to make this book project, but actually he couldn't uh, see it. He died in 2015, yes. But um, the, the Young Austria project was shown in the London School of Economics, a uh, big exhibition. And now the exhibition about the Three Sisters is in Vienna in the old town hall in the Dokumentationsarchiv des österreichischen Widerstandes. Uh, the Dokumentäre Archiv of Austrian Resistance. So, do you have an ask, <laughs> another question? Well, you know, I would think that thanks to you, the story has been brought to the fore. Yeah. You know, it takes just one person to recognize what somebody has done or a group of people have done um, in order to celebrate their contribution. And I think maybe that's part of the, um, the problem that we have around the world, that many people aren't celebrated for their contribution and aren't maybe recognized or acknowledged. Um, a question for Albie, how can we spread those amazing stories of women in the struggle further? We do have Women's Month, but it seems that those stories are not widely known. They're, they're not widely known, and uh, the Constitution Hill Trust, uh, which is based on Constitution Hill, uh, one of its functions is to tell stories of how we got the Constitution. And the Trust right now is completing a timeline of women in resistance to apartheid, uh, all the way through, going back to the late uh, 19th century, uh, Charlotte Kakeke, uh, the first woman graduate going to the United States, uh, many women in the decades that followed, and then particularly women in the resistance. And that timeline should be up uh, in a couple of weeks and available. We'll pass it on to the Holocaust Museums uh, so that everybody can share. And I must say, uh, you know, I was involved in the struggle myself I've learned so much. Maybe that's the nature of underground. There are lots of things happening. You don't know what other people are doing. And one of the things that came through to me actually was the role of white women in the struggle. It's, it's almost completely unknown. And they had a particular role because they could reach places where black women couldn't go. And sometimes women could reach places. My mother, who was then Ray Sachs, tells a story, told a story, she's late now, of being in the Communist Party in the 1930s, and she worked with a black woman, Josie Palmer, to try and reach black uh, mine workers. Uh, it was very cold. They could get through, the men couldn't get through with leaflets. And they had only one pair of gloves. So my mother, Ray, would wear the left, and Josie would wear the right for 10 minutes, and then after 10 minutes, they would swap the left and the right. But it's because women could get through where men couldn't. Years later, Eleanor, she became Eleanor Casrills, was one of the first members of Conte we see were in, in Durban. And she was able to get through to plant a bomb and electricity substation. They were very careful not to go for places that were inhabited. She could get through and she managed to escape afterwards. Marion Spilk, years later in Johannesburg, was sentenced to 25 years jail. As a white woman, she could get through to the police station at John Foster Square, uh, and she was charged with treason. Uh, so there were people from all different backgrounds. Uh, Fatima Mir played a very, very big role in, in Durban. Uh, she was locked up in the old Fort prison in the, in the women's jail. So all of these stories, we want to bring them out. Uh, the picture of Albertina Sassoulou was on your poster. Uh, and then, of course, Winnie Mandela, an extraordinary woman, passionate, powerful, many things she did, she was heavily criticized for, but she represented the struggle and the passion of the struggle in a way that almost nobody else did. All of these stories are conveyed in the timeline that should be up at Constitutional Hill Trust uh, in, in a couple of weeks' time. But I think that even from, from a South African point of view, generally, um, these are stories that we need to be talking about, not only in Women's Month. You know, for me, every day is Women's Day, um, not only the, the 9th of August. Um, 
Mm. So I'm, I'm very interested to see to see what you're doing there and, and how I'm sure education departments would love to integrate um, in the workshops that we do. Um, I have a question for um, either Sonia or Uli. Can the three sisters story in school learning system in Austria? Yes, because the Dokumentationsrecht des österreichischen Widerstandes, they have uh, school classes, they come and see the exhibition there. Uh, it will be shown till, until the 3rd of September and maybe in November, November again. So school classes have the chance to see this exhibition. Um, and, and Sonia, in, in the school curriculum as such, is there an element of, or is there a discussion of resistance? Is there a learning of what resistance is? Mm -hmm. and, and who were the people that formed part of a resistance movement, movement during the, the 30s and 40s? Um, I, I didn't hear it from my daughters. I have two daughters from school. They learned about Holocaust, but not nothing about resistance. Yeah. But I think in the university, it's a little bit different. So in the higher classes, they, they hear a little bit, but it's less. In Austria, the memorial starts in the 1980s when the president, Kurt Waldheim, was, uh, how you could explain this? It was a, a shock for the whole world that uh, a Nazi could be president in Austria. Uh, so it's said that he, he has been involved in, in Nazi uh, regime in Yugoslavia. So uh, this in this year, it started um, uh, a process to think about what, uh, what has done the Austrians in the resistance, uh, but but it was mainly uh, from the resistance uh, groups who said, we have done what the Moscow Declaration said, which Austria has, has to take part of the freedom. Yeah. Maybe of you can explain it a little bit better. No, well, it, it's in, in fact, it, it is what she said. Uh, 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 the the Waldheim affair, uh, you know, put, uh, um, made us uh, think much more about uh, uh, things that had happened and uh, where Austrians were involved and, and also, um, yeah. Yes, that Austrians were involved in the Nazi regime yeah. and, and the Austrian, and had, uh, uh, the survivors uh, of the Austrian resistance said, we have done a lot, but we are, we are small, we, we are not heard, we are yeah. not heard. Um, you spoke earlier about in your in your film about the suitcase that was given to you, um, and that the suitcase contained a lot of documents. Yeah. Um, what kind of documents did you find in the suitcase, and and what is is the suitcase on permanent exhibition, or, or was it purely for for the film? Uh, the suitcase was given by Georg Schulherrnstedt. He's the son of the youngest of the three sisters. Okay. And actually it was the suitcase of the oldest of the three, of Selma Steinmetz. And she was a, a journalist and author. So there was many papers of her work, but also documents of, of her birth and uh, many things, not so much of the resistance, because um, after the war, the French party gave awards and papers that they were part of the resistance. Uh, and the book shows mainly pictures uh, before the resistance, after the liberation because in France, in Belgium, you couldn't take pictures so much 
what you have done if you, you that, that doesn't work. <laughs> it was different in Great Britain because my grandparents, there was uh, in London and Manchester and they, they were also active against Hitler. My grandfather was in the, he worked for um, war important uh, for the airplane for the British army. And my grandmother, she was a tailoress. Yeah, she, she made uh, uniforms for the British army. So she was also involved against Hitler. And this young Austria group uh, organized cultural events to, uh, to make uh, a good uh, uh, thinking about Austria, that Austria shall be uh, accepted. accepted and shall, yes, uh, a cultural nation. shall be a, a state again after the war, yes. <laughs> and uh, so they had it much easier to make pictures uh, in Great Britain. So um, in my young Austria book, there's about a thousand pictures. It has 600 pages. And you see also pictures of some war during the World War II. And in the Selma Steinmetz, there are less pictures of that time, yes. But it has also about 100 pictures. And the exhibition is just a part of it. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure, because it's a big story to tell. OK, I have a question for LB. How can we make sure that the wonderful exhibitions at the women's jail on Constitutional Hill are, Hill are well maintained, perhaps even expanded, and that more international and domestic visitors visit the exhibitions. I observe that visitors to the Hill often focus their time on the old fort and number four. Uh, I'm also a great uh, fan of the women's jail and a very special exhibition they have there. There's some wonderful pictures by Fatima Mir, who was locked up there for a long time. Uh, and, and the paintings are there to be seen. They're great stories by women prisoners. Uh, one of them, Joyce Seroke, uh, who was locked up there. She's on the Constitution Hill Trust, still going strong these days. Uh, and the stories of the women are there. Uh, by and large, I think they are quite well maintained. By, by, by general museum standards. But what we're planning to, what we are doing now is creating virtual exhibitions so that it's great that people come to Constitution Hill. And it's a very remarkable place with the old prison uh, where pe people were so badly abused right next to the court that upholds the fundamental rights. And it was a woman chief justice who, who recently issued the instruction to Jacob Smith that he must be go to jail or prison. Uh, it, it, something that in the patriarchal days would have been absolutely unthinkable. But a woman chief justice, I think chief justice, could form a president to jail. Uh, so the whole site is, is very extraordinary and it's wonderful to visit. But we now have a virtual exhibition of the site, of the making of the constitution, uh, uh, the story of the Constitutional Court itself, of cases that are heard in the court, and the timeline will go up dealing with the women's jail. So I think that's something else information that we'll send to the Holocaust Museums to distribute to the people who are watching today. And, and so that the museum goes out to the people. That's one thing we To come to kind of the imaginative animation we have the making of the constitution and then many of the women prisoners the information for you if i didn't i click a button and i'd get it for you i can't get any of it for you but i can't promise it to making promises and I promise that the information will be given to you so that people can have access to
to all these stories and particularly learn more about Constitution Hill. Unmute myself. Um, thank you, Albie. And on that note, I'd like to say a huge thank you to Sonia and uh, and Uli. Um, because of technology, we were able to see your wonderful exhibition. Um, and to Albie, thank you very much for sharing with us um, some of the remarkable women who really did unbelievable things during the struggle. And uh, we hope that their memory will be remembered and will be spoken about. Um, next week, we, are, we have a wonderful story, The Life and Times of Hedy Lamar. Um, some of you will know her as the actress. Um, certainly, I know in my family, as soon as I mentioned the name Hedy Lamar, everybody went crazy because it brought back so many memories of, uh, of this beautiful, gorgeous woman. So that is going to be happening on the 3rd of August. Thank you all for attending. We hope to see you next week. Keep safe, be well, wear your mask, and God bless you all. Thank you.